Hi there. I'm Michael Rowe, and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Physiotherapy at the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town, South Africa. I'm going to talk today about um, some of the ways that we might think differently about uh, integrating technology into the classroom. Uh, we've all had this experience now where we've made this you know, significant shift towards uh, online and blended learning in the physiotherapy curriculum. Um, but, but I want to suggest that we are careful about how we uh, move forward. I think there's a lot of um, optimism um, around kind of moving physiotherapy education towards more blended and, and online forms um, of teaching practice. Um, but I do think that, you know, it, it seems unlikely that the decisions that we've made as physiotherapy educators um, in, in our response to the pandemic represent the, the optimal way of, of thinking about online and blended learning. So I want to um, spend today talking about how um, configurations matter um, and whether we're talking about a physical classroom where there are you know, walls, rows of desks, um, a lectern at the front or a blackboard at the front um, where the kind of source of information stands and, and passes information to students um, or whether we're talking about an online configuration. Um, both types of configuration determine to a large extent what kinds of interactions are possible in that space. And so if we think about our default configurations, whether it's in the, in the physical classroom or it's in a, a virtual environment, um, we need to think carefully about how the default configurations of those learning environments are determined to a large extent not by people who um, are really thinking about what works best for you and your students' learning, but they have other con considerations. So for example, a, a lecture theater like this one may be more um, focused on how to fit the most number of students into a space um, where they can you know, see what is projected onto a board. But you know, we know that that isn't an, an optimal configuration for meaningful um, and personal learning. I think it's really important to understand that what we have now doesn't represent the optimal configuration of online and blended learning. Uh, we did not move forward in a planned, uh, theoretically informed process of you know, deciding how we were going to implement um, blended forms of physiotherapy education in our curricula. And in many cases, people who uh, were doing online learning you know, must have hated the thought um, of doing it. And, and I, I think that somebody who is in that situation um, is probably not going to be spending most of their time trying to figure out how they can do it um, in, in the best possible way. Um, and so I think that, you know, what we're sitting with now um, almost certainly doesn't represent the best way of doing online and blended learning in physiotherapy education. And I think I'd like to suggest that we need to step back and reflect on where we find ourselves um, before we make any firm commitments to how we're going to move forward. Um, I think, you know, if, if you're like me, um, you know, I, I really think that there is um, enormous potential in the use of technology in physiotherapy education and, and in all kinds of professional and higher education in general. But I also think that it can be done poorly. And I think we, we find ourselves in a situation now where we can make a series of choices that will determine what physiotherapy education looks like for the next, you know, 30 to 50 years. And I don't think that that's an exaggeration. And w what I would hate to see is for people to move forward using their current configuration um, that has been informed by this knee-jerk response to the pandemic and to think that that represents the best way that we can do online learning in, in physiotherapy education. I think that what we have now probably is a replication of what existed uh, a year ago. Um, and if you think about physiotherapy education, um, it, it probably didn't look very different to this. Um, this is an illustration from about 500 years ago, um, a, a university in Italy. And, you know, it, it looks almost exactly like what our current classrooms look like. And it made sense um, 500 years ago when, you know, that book may have been the only book in the country, um, maybe on the continent. Um, and so it made sense to aggregate expertise and content in these places of learning. And people had to come to the places 
to hear the words being spoken because you know there was a scarcity of um of content um specialized content at least um but you know in in today's world this really doesn't represent any kind of optimal configuration um and and i think what probably happened is uh the shift to online and blended learning probably aimed to reproduce exactly this environment and and i don't know how many people are doing zoom lectures for example where you you get students to log into um, a, a room on zoom and you talk to them for an hour um, much as you might have done in the classroom and and i think this probably was fine in uh, the context of the pandemic um, because you know we we really just were trying to figure out how we could best you know finish the finish the academic year um, but you know is this the optimal um, configuration of of online learning for for students and you know we also need to understand that for a student who um, you know struggles financially um, getting to campus is one thing and and there's a cost associated with getting to campus but there's a massive cost associated with having to be online um, you know six hours of the day you know watching streaming video um, and, and I think you know we need to take into account that not all of our students um, are equally prepared um, financially, socially, um, to to manage that kind of learning environment. I think we also need to be very clear that um, you know the the way that um, learning management systems are set up um, are absolutely not set up to um, satisfy student learning needs. They, they really are set up to reduce the administrative cost for uh, lecturers. Um, and if you think about the way that most people use a learning management system, it really is just about putting content into the learning management system that students can go and download. Um, but there's no reason that you can't do the same thing with email. And I would probably argue that email is a more effective way of distributing content because email goes to the student. They don't have to go to a learning management system, log in, navigate to the right module, find the resource that they need to download. Uh, whereas email, you know, it just shows up um, in the in the inbox. So I think we we need to think about you know student centered learning, and a lot of us pay, pay lip service to what that means. Um, but we need to choose educational technology that puts the students and their learning needs at the center, rather than what is convenient for for teachers and administrators. We also seem to think that educational technologies are neutral and that there are no values and intentions um, that inform their design. Um, you know, if you use Facebook and, and Google, um, I think, you know, that's absolutely fine. But you do need to understand that Facebook and Google are beholden to um, uh, shareholders and, you know, th that, the, you know, the primary function of Facebook and, and Google is to turn a profit for those shareholders. Um, Facebook does not design any tool to enhance your students' learning. Um, Facebook designs tools that keep you on Facebook so that they can show you more ads to increase the value of um, the, the company for their shareholders. Um, and, you know, it, it may be that the tools that Facebook is building <clears throat> are really well aligned with the student learning uh, your students learning needs um, and that that's great um, but you know as as Freire, um you know said you know 40 years ago um, there's no such thing as a neutral educational process every decision that we make as a teacher is a political decision that has an effect on on students and that is informed by our own personal values our own pedagogical values um, and so we need to think about that when we make decisions about the, the tools that we're going to be implementing in, in our classrooms. So just to reinforce this idea that educational technology is ideological, the choices we make determine the ways in which we're able to configure our teaching and learning spaces, and that the default configuration of those tools is almost certainly not designed for an optimal learning experience for, for students and, and not an optimal teaching experience for, for teachers. Um, and, and I think when you find that you are making decisions to align your teaching so that it fits the technology, then, then something is wrong. Um, 
digital tools offer the opportunity to refocus how power works in the classroom. So we can use digital tools to move some of the um, power differential towards students so that it's more weighted heavily on, on their side. And, and this means giving students more control over what, what they learn, how they learn, where they learn, um, what kind of outcomes are included in, um, in the curriculum. Um, I think that to, to simply reproduce the way that we um, have a dominant power structure in the classroom at the moment where you know I stand at the front and everyone looks at me and I'm above everyone else. Um, you know, I, I think that, that if, if all we're doing is reproducing that with digital tools, then, then I think we're missing a, a massive opportunity um, to change physiotherapy education for the better. Um, another useful framework is critical pedagogy, which um, is the idea that the student's personal experience brought into the classroom is a really meaningful anchor around which to talk about learning. So r rather than having a decontextualized learning experience, um, we can have students bring their personal um, lives into the classroom and try to connect what it is that we're learning or try to help students connect what they're learning to their own personal experiences. And then to give them, to empower students um, with knowledge and skills that enable them and encourage them or, or even require them to act on the world, to change the world. Um, and I, and I think digital tools are especially powerful for this. And one of the main reasons is because that the products of learning can be shared with anyone in the world. Um, and so if you think about a blog as a learning portfolio, students can make their learning, make their process available for anyone in the world to see. And that is a way of acting on the world. So I think this idea of critical pedagogy can really inform what we choose to do with digital tools um, in the classroom. Stephen Downs talks about these principles of open network learning, which are autonomy, which is um, the, the ability to make choices about your own learning, uh, diversity, um, which is uh, the idea that we can um, be um, exposed to a variety of different perspectives on a topic rather than just the lecturers, um, for example. Um, openness, which means that um, we can choose different learning paths towards achieving the same outcome. We can share um, we can bring things from outside the curriculum into the curriculum. Um, and then finally, interaction, which is the idea that learning should not be isolated and individual. We should be able to interact with others as part of our, our learning environment. And I think if we're looking for digital tools moving forward in, in physiotherapy education, we want to try and find tools that satisfy um, these kinds of requirements um, rather than some of, the, some of the tools that no doubt people are using at the moment. Um, I think this is a very powerful um, matrix that you can use to think about um, your, your own teaching and how you're using technology. Um, if you go to the URL at the bottom, there, it links to a podcast where I, I talk with a, a, a colleague um, about you know, how, we, how we have used this matrix um, to think about technology that we've, um, not just technology, but we, we use it. I think that this matrix is a really powerful way for us to think about how to um, use technology um, moving forward in the curriculum. So you can see in the top left, we can talk about things that we've started, but which need to come to an end uh, now that the, well, when the lockdown is over. But then there will have been other things that we've started in the top right, where we actually want to amplify what we're doing as we move forward into the future. And then in the bottom left, there, there are things that we would have stopped. Um, doing um, and we may have realized by now that the reason we were doing them was really just momentum and tradition and that we can actually you know there's no point in restarting those things but then in the bottom right there are things that we would have stopped during the lockdown that we now need to to restart so I think this is a very useful framework to think about how we want to use digital tools uh, moving forward in in physiotherapy education and that's it. I, I hope that this has been a, a useful um, session um, and I, I look forward to any questions that you may have.